But my name is Aileen Kennedy, and I've been researching on neurological theories about gender development and how that's impacted on the way law and medicine deal with intersex minors and transgender minors. Um, let me just admit Shell. Now I'm screen sharing. Can you see my slides? Great, okay. Um, so the title of my talk is, is Brain Sex Binary and the Law. And um, I'm in this, I'm addressing a theory in neuroscience, which is fairly popular. And the theory is that men and women have brains that are distinctly different. And these differences in the brains of men and women explain why men and women behave differently. And there are different versions of this theory. Um, there are different versions of this theory um, that are present in neuroscience research. So some are more extreme than others. Um, and I call these theories the whole brain sex binary theories um, because they rely on the idea that men and women are naturally different because they have brains that are naturally different. So this idea promotes an idea that men and women are different kinds of human beings and dividing the world into male and female and assuming that that binary division is normal and natural has long been a dominant theme in Western culture and has been the focus of science research since the 18th century. So brain sex binary, I argue, is just the latest in a series of scientific theories that women and men can be divided into two distinct universal categories based on their biological differences. And so for about the last three centuries, researchers have looked for a way to reliably categorize all human beings as either essentially male or essentially female. And that project has been particularly important since med medical men have sought to manage people with intersex variations. So what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is um, I'm gonna start by explaining what brain sex theory is and how it's emerged in the law as it relates to transgender minors. I'm gonna look at the um, scientific study of sex differences and this quest for true sex. Then I'm gonna look at research on how gender identity develops in people who have um, intersex variations, or at least how the, what the research says about that. And the research does not support brain sex binary theory, in fact. Then I'll talk a little bit about the history of medical management of intersex variation. But I'm, in that discussion, I'm going to focus on theories and practices developed by John Money. Could I ask people to mute their microphones for the moment? Um, and I'm going to talk about the fact that Money's theory of, of gender development in intersex people has continued to be used in um, modern medical interventions on intersex people, even though clinicians now publicly reject the theory. And law has just deferred to this clinical position and has adopted the medical approach in its decision making uh, about whether or not children with intersex variations should be subjected to um, medical interventions. So starting with then what brain sex theory is, so typically, you, you're probably familiar with this idea that a fetus with XY chromosomes um, has male gonads and excretes androgens at critical stages during fetal development. So this is the typical um, sex development. And androgen exposure then is said to trigger male genital development and, and, and other somatic changes in, in, the, in the, the fetal body. So brain sex theory is that this same surge of fetal androgens during, um, during pregnancy also changes the way the brain develops. It masculinizes brain development. So it produces changes in the actual brain tissue or the soma. It produces changes in the brain structures, um, the size and volume of different brain lobes and different brain features. And it also changes the way the brain is organized. So how different parts of the brain interact. And so in that sense, androgen exposure, high androgen exposure in utero produces a brain that is distinctly male in its tissue, in its structures and in its organization. 
And conversely, the absence of androgens in, fetus, in, in the fetus will cause a female develop, uh, brain to develop because the female is the default brain. And these differences between female brains and male brains are seen as anatomically significant and as producing differences in how men and women think, how they experience emotion, how they approach different tasks, their various aptitudes and interests and so on. And I, you know, I've got up there a chart these are a dime a dozen. If you search on the internet, you can see all these different charts that will tell you what kind of characteristics or traits or interests a male and a female brain will produce. So males like to make lists. They like to read maps. Um, they're kind of uh, focused, whereas women are more emotional. They're more intuitive. They're better at language and all that sort of stuff. So that's the theory of... Um, you know, in a very simplistic nutshell, the theory of brain sex binary. And this research doesn't just look at differences between men and women. It also speculates that behavior and sexuality and identity that's atypical of a person's biological sex can be explained by looking at their brains. Has a lesbian woman somehow developed some brain features that are more typical of a man's brain? Can that explain why a woman who would be expected to be attracted to men is actually attracted to women? Can the you know, differences between brain structures explain why a person who has typical male biology would develop a female gender identity? And brain sex researchers have been looking for answers to these questions for many decades. Now, despite an absence of clear, unambiguous evidence to date, there are a number of studies which do support the idea that sexual orientation and gender identity development have strong genetic and neurological components. And this idea was explored- Eileen, and... excuse me, can yes. you hear me? We can't see your slides for some reason. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry, I did think I asked that at the beginning. That's all right. There's lots of us that can't see them. Um, normally what helps in this situation is if you stop sharing your screen and then reshare it again. Thank you. Okay, let me share again. My apologies for that. Not that they're that great, but um, it's better than staring at my face. Is that better? I can see them. Yep, do you just want to do a run through of moving through them? Yep, we can see them moving now. Okay, great. Thank you. And sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, the, the thesis that men's and women's brain development might develop in atypical ways, which will produce um, heteros homosexuality or uh, transgender identity um, was explored in a case in 2001 in the family court. The case was called Re Kevin, and it was about a post-operative trans man who wanted to marry as a man. And at the, you know that was before um, same-sex marriage was legalized. And so Justice Chisholm had to decide whether or not Kevin could be regarded legally as a man. And in the course of his judgment, Justice Chisholm looked in a lot of detail, an unusual amount of detail at, um, the, uh, at the evidence of brain sex theory, that the way in which Kevin's brain had developed was atypical for um, his biological sex. And he concluded that this brain sex theory provides an explanation for what's otherwise inexplicable. So since 2001, uh, actually since 1996, the family courts had responsibility for deciding whether transgender minors should have access to medical treatment, um, gender affirming treatment to alter their bodies, um, to give better expression to their gender identity. Now, the first case was heard in 2004, it was called Re-Alex. And that was the first of over a hundred cases that the courts gave approval for um, gender affirming treatment. 
and I'm not going to go into any detail in those cases because my focus is going to be on intersex. But in the course of those cases, the court doesn't directly endorse um, brain sex binary theory, but they rely instead on the consensus amongst the medical professionals that the gender affirming treatment is effective. And, um, and so that's the basis on which they have allowed um, uh, transgender children to access medical treatment. And there's so many alignments between that treatment protocol and brain sex binary theory that I argue that the law indirectly endorses brain sex binary theory in responding to children who are transgender. But a really different picture emerges um, when it comes to intersex people. So I'm going to now turn to intersex issues and talk about how the judiciary makes decisions about minors who have intersex variations and, and the way, what, what basis they do it on if they don't endorse a brain sex binary theory, what's the basis for their decision making. So even though we think of brain sex research as really modern and innovative, I argue it's just a continuation of a centuries long search for uh, what they call a true sex marker. So a biological factor that can be used to diagnose and define whether a person is essentially male or female. And this began um, in scientific research, as I said, about 300 years ago. And I argue that the brain is just the latest candidate. Different somatic characteristics from the gonads to hormones to chromosomes have previously been the focus of and regarded as candidates for this role of marking and determining a person's true sex. Now, of course, these ideas about differences between the sexes and between races, indeed, are not politically and never have been politically and socially neutral. So scientific interest in finding the biological source of differences between men and women has emerged most urgently at times when there have been social challenges to accepted hierarchies of sex and race and sexuality. So in other words, behavior that seems to threaten the boundaries between different status categories. For example, women fighting for enfranchisement or periods where there's a perception that black people or Jewish people are passing as white or when there's a perception of an increased tolerance for homosexual behavior, then all these cultural anxieties would manifest in the scientific realm in this search for scientific evidence that would bolster these different boundaries and categories by which people could be classified and ranked. So scientific theories about true sex were developed to deal with these boundary threats and they impact most starkly and powerfully where um, the medical professionals have sought to manage and define intersex people. So bodies which aren't easily classified as male or female based on stereotypical definitions of normality present a challenge to biomedical claims that um, the distinctions between men and women are natural and inviolable. And law demands clear boundaries and categories by which humans and their legal rights and status can be defined and regulated. So this potential for boundary crossing is deeply threatening to the natural order. And it, for example, in the Victorian era, the medical establishment was consolidating at that time its professional authority. And part of that was having authority to make definitive decisions about people with intersex variations. So was this ambiguous body truly a man or truly a woman? And each person had to be either male or female because humans are naturally and innately male or female. Now, initially there was no agreement or consensus about how you would make that decision, but gradually there emerged um, a consensus that a person's true sex could be, was always indicated by their gonadal tissue. So if a person had female gonads, they were female and it didn't matter what the rest of their body uh, looked like or how they felt or their upbringing or, or their internal identity. That was all irrelevant. If they had female gonadal tissue, then they were female. And if they had male gonadal tissue, they were male. And um, this, this um, sort of decision was before there was effective technology to image 
inside a person's body or anesthesia to allow exploratory surgery, which made the gonads effectively invisible. And despite that, they still remained central in this idea of whether of deciding whether a person was male or female. And this was such an entrenched position for many decades that the, the language used to diagnose and clinically describe intersex bodies was based on the sex of the gonadal tissue. And the next candidate following um, the gonads, which was the age of the, uh, the Victorian era, the next candidate was the sex hormones. So this uh, discovery of sex hormones um, was intense and um, the investigation was intense in the 19th and 20th centuries, but the research was initially hampered by a strong commitment to the idea that female sex hormones would only be found in female organisms and that male sex hormones could only be present in males. And so the complexity of hormones and their impact on the body was really poorly understood and misconstrued for a lot of decades because of this initial uh, preconception. Gradually, these, these assumptions gave way to emerging evidence that this model of duality that the, that the um, scientists had adopted, the endocrinologists had adopted, oops, sorry, apologies. Um, you know, that actually male animal testes are the richest source of female sex hormones and male sex hormones are produced by female bodies. Um, so eventually they, they started to realize the, the, the reality that um, male and female sex hormones are not confined to male and female bodies. So this focus on sex hormones was gradually displaced with a focus on genetics as we discovered chromosomes and in particular sex chromosomes and the X and Y chromosomes then became these little symbols of uh, the sex binary. Um, and to anchor this idea of sex as biologically fixed and unalterable. But as with the gonads and as with sex hormones, this perception of genetics as um, an exemplar of biological hardwiring um, yielded as there was more evidence of complex, rich integration between nature and nurture. And so in particular, epigenetics, which shows that a genetic inheritance is altered by a person's environmental factors such as poverty and trauma, that's contributed to this acknowledgement among scientists that sex in humans is not diagnosable by any single factor. I want to turn and you know I've just included genitals and, and brain on that on that list of different markers of true sex um, that have emerged in the last couple of hundred years. But what I want to do now is turn to um, medical management of intersex in the 20th century, and in particular, to a discussion around John Money's um, uh, theory about gender development, because I, I theorize that this paradigm of gender development is still operating in relation to how medical establishment treats intersex variations today. So the this paradigm um, emerged in the second half of the 20th century and it was spearheaded by a sexologist by the name of John Money, <clears throat> who worked at Johns Hopkins Hospital in the US. And Money developed a complex theory um, of gender acquisition, which incorporated a number of different inputs and feedback loops. Fundamentally though, according to Money's theory, gender identity isn't inherently fixed in human beings but it develops at around the age of three years. And at that time, the child reaches what money called the gender identity gate. Once the gender identity gate closes at the age of three, then gender will be fixed and stable. The development though of a stable gender identity depends largely on how the child is reared. So uh, nurture uh, plays a large role in the development of a stable gender identity according to this theory. However, that gender identity will only be stable if the rearing doesn't clash with the child's visible anatomy. And as long as there's no dissonance between rearing and anatomy, then a child's sex identity will develop in a stable and healthy way. For money, the only significant feature of visible anatomy 
was whether or not the infant had a, an adequate penis. So the absence of an adequate penis meant that the child would never develop a stale, a, a stable male gender identity, or at least it would be highly problematic. Now, to no one's surprise, this part of Money's theory is uh, adapted from Freudian theory. So unlike being a girl without a vagina, being a boy with a less than typical masculine anatomy was considered to be psychologically damaging and would prevent that child from developing stable gender. So accordingly, if any child presented um, who didn't have an adequate penis, that child should be raised as a girl. And surgical innovations and technical developments were important within this protocol because surgeons could cosmetically fashion what they considered to be a convincing looking vagina and they would cut down the phallus to a correct size for a clitoris. So if the, age, the Victorian era was the age of the gonads, then the second half of the 20th century could be called the age of the penis. And these protocols that money developed were built on this notion that perfect genders could be achieved in intersex people as long as all evidence of contradiction, all evidence of contradiction in the body could be eliminated. So when it came to rearing, children were reared in accordance with very strict, rigid gender stereotyping. The whole family became a kind of micro clinic where behavior patterns and traits were monitored and enforced in order to discipline the child into gender conformity. And that would help to ensure the emergence of stable gender identity. Decisions about gender assignment were, as I mentioned above, biased towards female assignment because of this centrality of penis size. And one pediatric surgeon was quoted as saying that the decision to raise a child with male pseudohermaphroditism as a male or female is dictated entirely by the size of the phallus. Um, so um, most of these children um, were raised as girls. Now, interestingly, there's a striking lack of attention in money's treatment protocols to the size and shape requirements of female genitals. Other than that, the clitoris couldn't be too big and the vagina had to be able to receive an erect penis. Now, no attention was paid to sexual pleasure, to sensitivity. Um, in fact, there's evidence that clitorectomy, a total removal of the clitoris, was performed on many children assigned female right up until the 1970s. So the focus of these treatments was explicitly on appearance and passive sexual function. John Money's fall from grace um, is attributed usually to revelations about a key case, um, often referred to as the John Joan case in which Money was involved. So in 1967, uh, Money was approached by the parents of a child called David Reimer. David was an identical twin. He was about 18 months old and his penis was destroyed in a medical procedure that went seriously wrong. So, from Money's perspective, David provided a perfect test case for his optimal gender theory. He was a good candidate because um, he was biologically normal and therefore uh, he would show how this um, optimal gender theory would work out. Even better though, he was an identical twin. So there was an inbuilt control for the experiment. So Money took on David's case and recommended that David's testicles and and what, what was left of his penis were surgically removed. And following that, um, Money instructed David's parents to engage in rigid gender socialization. Uh, David was given the name Brenda. And um, in the publications, Money refers to the David Brenda case as the Joan John case. So in line with treatment protocols for intersex children, David's medical history was kept a secret not only from David, but also from David's teachers, family, friends, and anyone connected with the family as far as possible. And so according to the theory, the success of David's female assignment depended on them implementing this feminine socialization as strictly as possible. And of course, this socialization was based on highly stereotyped understanding of normal female behavior. And so David returned to Money's clinic every year and Money would report on the success of this project in his many articles and in particular in a book called Man and Woman, Boy and Girl. 
But reports about David Brenda dried up in Money's writing at around the time that she would have been going through puberty. And this aroused the curiosity of an academic called Milton Diamond. And he was exploring the impact of hormones on gender development. And he was convinced that at puberty, Joan would struggle. And so he sort of followed, tried to follow up the case and discovered that when uh, Brenda was age 14, she'd rejected hormone treatment and refused to continue living as a girl um, and took back the name of David. And, and, and David went on to live as a man and ultimately to marry and raise children as a man. And Diamond tracked um, David Reimer down and interviewed him and reports that David was very upset knowing that John Money had used him as an exemplar of the success of optimal gender theory. And in fact, David's story was ultimately um, captured in a best-selling novel by John Calpinto. Um, but tragically, David Reimer suicided a few years later. Now, at the same time that David Reimer's story was unfolding, it was an upsurge of political activism by intersex people challenging the legitimacy and ethics of their treatment at the hands of the medical establishment. And a key figure in that movement was Cheryl Chase, who founded the Intersex Society of North America. And she had a profound impact on intersex activism worldwide. Now, that happened in the mid 1990s. And, and since that time, clinicians and health authorities have publicly rejected optimal gender theory and money's treatment protocols. Um, but I would argue that those pro protocols continue to dominate medical practice but they continue uh, on the basis of a different set of justifications. And a lot of brain sex binary research is based on studies of people with intersex variations. And that's because intersex um, signals the impact of atypical prenatal hormones. So people who have natural variations in sex characteristics look to brain sex researchers like a perfect natural, perfect participants for a natural experiment. So if brain sex theory is correct, then that means that high fetal androgen exposure in uh, people who are X, XX should cause masculinization of their behavior, their sexual orientation and their gender identity. And so for that reason, studies of women um, with CAH, the most common intersex variation, are the backbone of brain sex binary theory and research. And the research focuses on the so-called masculinized behavior and sexuality of women uh, with CAH. So in other words, um, same sex attraction and behavior, um, which is sort of tomboyish, is seen as evidence in support of the idea that the impact of fetal androgens have produced male typical brains in female bodies. But um, the evidence on gender identity of genetic women with CAH doesn't really support brain sex theory very well, because despite high levels of, um, sorry, exposure to high levels of androgen in utero, um, most um, genetic females with CAH identify as females and not as males. So 90 to 95% of uh, women with CAH um, identifies women. Um, now that percentage um, who identifies male is higher than average, um, but it doesn't fit neatly into the brain sex binary theory. And similarly, variations like uh, 5 AID and 17 um, beta HSD, uh, which cause low androgen exposure in utero, uh, where the fetus is genetically male, According to that brain sex theory, they should develop uh, feminization um, in terms of their gender identity, sexuality, and behavior. In other words, children with XY genes exposed to low androgen levels in utero should act feminine, should be attracted to men, and should identify as women. But this isn't supported by the research either. So the evidence uh, in those two particular variations is that 60% of um, genetic males develop a male gender identity. And so 
the evidence shows that the relationship between gender identity development and fetal androgen exposure is really complicated. And most of the research, which is looking at assigning sex, concludes that fetal androgen levels don't provide a good indicator of gender development. Instead, most of these articles conclude that sex of rearing is a better indicator. Now, this is true. Sex of rearing more often lines up with gender identity than, um, than does fetal androgen exposure. But nevertheless, sex of rearing is not a good indicator. It's better than um, fetal androgen exposure, but it's still not a, uh, sorry, there's people in the waiting room for some reason. Um, so it's not a good indicator. And, you know, because most intersex people do identify with their sex of rearing, but levels of gender change and, and gender dysphoria are significantly higher amongst intersex people than they are for endosex people. So I want to explore briefly some of the other factors that might have a deep impact on uh, the gender behavior, sexuality, or identity of people with variations in their sex characteristics. Um, and I'm going to go back to the research on genetic women uh, who have CAH, but I just wanted to warn people that this may be triggering because some of the, um, some of the factors that I speak of are, are, are quite traumatic and, uh, and upsetting. So I just wanted to put that out there at the outset. Um, so going back to the research on women um, who have uh, CAH, uh, the brain sex research kind of asserts with some confidence that um, that high androgen exposure produces the masculinized behavior and sexuality of women with CAH. In other words, girls and women with CAH are identified as tomboyish and often um, attracted to women, sexually, um, sexually attracted to women. But this research relies almost exclusively on theories about fetal androgen exposure, and they ignore, uh, ignore significant factors that are likely to impact on a person's gendered behavior and sexuality and identity. So Rebecca Jordan Young, for example, argues that um, CH itself impacts significantly on a person's metabolism, and so it can produce obesity, high blood cholesterol, insulin resistance, um, low bone density and osteoporosis. So these metabolic differences will have a, a, a major impact on morphology sometimes. So women with CAH on average are short, more hirsute and more likely to be obese and, and have acne. And all of these are markers in a society which values tall, slender, hairless and smooth skinned women. And so that kind of impact is likely to make a difference to how uh, women with CH see themselves in terms of femininity, but these more nuanced ideas focusing on people's lived experiences are just ignored in the clinical literature for the most part. Now, another important point made by Jordan Young is that medical researchers assume that all medical interventions will alleviate problems affecting people with intersex variations and will always produce positive outcomes or at worst will be neutral. They never consider the ways that treatment itself constitutes a serious interference in the way people develop sexuality and gender. So not only are intersex minors subjected to extensive surgeries, particularly genital surgeries, um, but also intersex minors and their families are closely scrutinized and monitored um, in relation to their gender behavior, to their gender role, to their sexuality. And aside from all the devastating effects of clitoral reduction, vaginoplasty, dilation, labiaplasty, gonadectomy, hypospadias repairs, etc., most of which will require multiple surgeries. They're also monitored closely uh, via regular visits to medical specialists. And that will often involve intrusive and regular scrutiny inspection of genitals, questions about preferences, skills, aptitudes, likes and dislikes, and as intersex children grow up, questions, intrusive questions about genital sensations and sexual desires and fantasies. So unsurprisingly, 
Um, intersex people find medical interventions often are often experienced as shaming and traumatic, um, and their outcomes are often disastrous. So in 2017, a, a, a good survey was conducted in Australia of intersex people. And in that survey, most of the participants reported negative experiences and outcomes of surgery. So um, that survey, the report says that scarring was the most recurrent theme for those who had genital or chest surgeries. And that was described in over a third of responses. And that was followed by decreased or loss of sensation, pleasure, climax, and, and infections. So these reports indicate that a lot of these interventions are experienced as highly traumatic. And, and furthermore, intersex people report that many of their encounters with medical professionals are humiliating. So people reported being spoken to or treated in a way that suggested that their natural genitals were dirty or shameful by medical staff during surgery, pre-care or aftercare, or being outright ignored. Several individuals experienced extreme trauma and anxiety in medical settings because they received interventions without consent. Few people had either experienced the treatment process as sexual abuse or reported additional incidents of sexual abuse by doctors during their so-called treatment sessions or explained that their shame about their genitals made them more susceptible to sexually abusive dynamics subsequent to the surgery. So finally, I want to explore the idea that often the outcomes of medical interventions on um, intersex people are experienced as quite disastrous. So given the negative accounts of the limited, so there's very limited research on outcomes of genital surgery, um, sterilization procedures and so on. But what limited evidence there is, um, reports on um, loss of sensation, diminished capacity for orgasm, painful penetration. So all these negative associations are completely unsurprising. And these are matters that touch on the most fundamental understanding of our gendered body. They implicate intimate aspects of a person's experience of their sexual and their sexed being. And it would be astonishing if these experiences didn't impact significantly on developing behavior and sexuality and gender identity. Brain organization researchers look at high rates of homosexuality among women with CAH, and they regard that as solid evidence of hormonal impact. Um, but in this literature, again, it's virtually unknown to look to other explanations, such as the profound difficulties in having sex in the orthodox heterosexual way, that is vaginal penetration with an erect penis. So Jordan Young has, has commented on the fact that there's an assumption that vaginal penetration is somehow a gold standard of heterosexual sex. But women who have undergone vaginoplasty often experience penetration as painful and uncomfortable. So women who've had clitoral surgeries often find it difficult to orgasm. And these factors are, are likely to contribute to why CAH women may be asexual or may engage in sex with other women. And that's borne out by comments made in the survey that I mentioned above, uh, where a few participants were looking for partners for whom penetrative sex was a focal point. So they were looking for people who weren't interested in penetrative sex. And when asked about the impact that their variations and in medical interventions had on their sex life, the largest thing that emerged was that, um, that all of these um, interventions negatively impacted on um, sexual ability and desire. And so one of the least popular sexual activities identified by participants in the study was penetrative sex. So all of these other explanations for, uh, or other factors likely to impact on people's um, gender development in terms of their behavior, their sexuality and their identity are completely ignored in much of the research. So I want to turn now to the legal cases on intersex because you know I've got to have some law in here to justify. Um, now there have only been eight cases uh, brought before the family court for approval to perform medical interventions on intersex people. There's no real explanation for why only eight of the many thousands of procedures that have been performed, why only eight have, um, have been 
uh, done under court authority. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all of the cases. I'm just going to focus on two cases, Re Leslie and Re Carla. Both Leslie and Carla had a variation or have a variation clinically referred to as um, 17 beta HSD. And that produces a, um, a lowering of androgen levels in utero. The traditional approach to children born with ambiguous genitals as a result of this variation has been to assign these children as female. And that's because of that thesis that I talked about that um, children who didn't have an adequate penis should never be assigned male. And that, that approach to assign these children female is um, at odds with a significant, so a large and well-known body of research that the majority of children with that variation will develop a male gender identity. Now, both Re Carla and Re Leslie, the court applications sought approval to proceed with irreversible treatment, including sterilization surgery and genital normalizing surgery. Assuming that, sorry, the, neither of the applications asked for approval for genital normalizing surgery because that had already been performed on both of them. Um, but they got permission to do more surgery in case it was needed. So there was this assumption that the child would be assigned female and would develop a female gender identity, despite this, this large body of evidence otherwise. So in both cases, the reasons for decisions presented very confused and incoherent uh, models of gender identity development. Um, so in Re Leslie, there was evidence there was evidence about this substantial body of evidence, sorry, there was evidence about this substantial body of research that 60% of children with this variation identify male at puberty. And that evidence was dismissed by the judge on the basis that the research was largely from India and Pakistan. And the explanation was that in India and Pakistan, there are cultural advantages to being male and therefore that produced uh, male gender identity in these intersex children, which is a really strange understanding. It's like um, suggesting that um, our gender identity is somehow, uh, we can use it instrumentally so we can decide which uh, sex we want to identify with based on cultural advantage. Um, in Re Carla, this body of literature isn't even mentioned. So instead, the judge relies on evidence of a psychiatrist who had seen Carla when she was three years old. And the psychiatrist based his conviction, or he said that he based his conviction on, and sorry for all the text here, um, I won't go through the whole thing, but I, I think this really sort of shows um, you know, how appalling uh, this decision was. He based this decision, he formed his opinion that Carla had developed a female gender identity on things like her parents describing that she had a female gender identity. They gave him photos, uh, not clear how a photo can show gender identity. Um, she spoke in an age appropriate manner and described a range of interests and toys and colors which were stereotypically female. For example, pink curtains, Barbie bedspread and camper van, necklaces, lip gloss, fairy station. She wore a floral skirt, glittery sandal and Minnie Mouse underwear and had her long blonde hair tied in braids. Just completely ignoring the fact that most of these factors, um, what they really disclose is Carla's parents' uh, preference for her gender identity. So this, this assessment was made when Carla was three years old and shortly afterwards the surgeon performed genital surgery um, to normalize the appearance of her genitals by reducing the size of her clitoris. And then the matter, ca matter came to court three years later and the judge authorized the performance of an orchiectomy, um, sterilizing her and uh, dooming her to a lifetime of hormones. Um, in these cases, in, in all of the cases, but particularly in these two cases, gender identity is, is configured in, in some places as, as being unreliable and labile and, and un, you know, unstable. 
and it suggested that gender identity development is open to choice. At the same time, there's a lot of evidence and discussion that assumes that gender identity is rigid and static and resilient to any attempt to change it. So the medical and judicial understanding of gender identity that, that emerges in these cases is really confused and incoherent. And this decision to surgically and medically assign Carla and Leslie as female on the basis of a stable and fixed gender identity in defiance of this body of evidence um, is, seems at first completely inexplicable. But if we start to think about the theory of gender, optimal gender, and about money's protocols, then these cases fall into place. We can see that, in fact, they are completely compliant with money's optimal gender treatment protocols. So in both cases, the court uncritically endorses and adopts the medical evidence without testing it or challenging it in any way. And in Re Carla, Justice Forrest even goes so far as to suggest that early surgery is preferable because it will be less, and I'm quoting, less psychologically traumatic for Carla if it is performed before she's able to understand the nature of the procedure. So these attitudes and these practices clearly reflect the practices and protocols established by John Money and his colleagues in the 1950s. So, um, so what, sorry, I haven't been keeping up with the slides. It's a bad, it's a bad habit I have. So um, I argue that the law shouldn't be acting on any theory, either brain sex theory or, or optimal gender theory in purporting to identify the true sex of people. Instead, the profound complexity of sex and gender development should be acknowledged because I don't think bioscience really understands how sex and gender or the mechanisms of gender identity formation happen. I don't think they under, it's, it's well understood by science. So research into the nature of sex and gender is important um, and necessary, but should be conducted without relying on sexist assumptions and stereotypes, without reducing, um, you know, reducing sex and gender to essentialist ideas um, and, um, you know, without, acting on it in, in terms of medical interventions. Um, so theory seeking to identify biological determinants of true sex and gender all start from the same place. They start from a presumption that sex and gender are natural binaries that naturally correlate, that biology always determines sex, which in turn determines gen gender, and that sex and gender express universal foundational categories, which are or which become rigid and static. So this legal approach, which the judges have adopted, which completely follows um, the medical protocols has led to significant harm for intersex minors who are subjected to highly invasive, involuntary medical interventions, which are aimed at shaping both their gender identity and their bodies to be consistent with a rigid sex binary. And this legal attitude has authorized human rights violations and has betrayed the bodily integrity of all intersex minors who are vulnerable to these medical regimes. Okay, that's, that's everything. Um, so I'd like to open the floor to questions. Firstly, um, I'd like to thank you for a, a great presentation. Thank you. It, it's certainly a new area of interest of mine, some of which is highly disturbing uh, as a human being, but um, in reality, we know it exists. I practice primarily in the areas of family and human rights law, uh, protecting children from these procedures. Um, and um, it's it's been quite... Um, uh, informative. So I thank you very much for the information that you've presented tonight. It, it's been quite helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't, of course, at the age of the penis. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, some of these ideas are so crude, it's hard to believe that they could 
be so resilient to challenge and so um, you know continue to to be dominant for such a long time. Hi, Aileen. It's Michelle here. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Um, I have CAH, um, and some of what you said I agree with, and a lot of what you said I disagree with. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was, bought, I was pretty much a tomboy growing up. Um, I played a lot of boys type sports and played with my brothers instead of my sister. Hated, hated dolls. <laughs> And all that type of thing. Um, but then you mentioned um, there's a slide there about obesity and uh, diabetes and stuff like that. And most of what was on there I don't have. So um, that's quite interesting. Um, I do have low bone density, but all that stuff is all contributed by medication. Um, and I don't have obesity. So I don't have any of that typical stuff. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't think CAH really is typical. I mean, I know other women with it and there's quite a mixture of the people that I know, and I don't know a lot of them, but the ones I know are non-binary, lesbian and heterosexual. And there's two of each. So, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I don't think any of those figures are really true. I'm sorry if I gave the impression that I was describing all intersex uh, all women with CAH. Um, I was just um, expressing the idea that often um, women who have CAH may have these different metabolic um, uh, circumstances which can lead to those kinds of body change. So I do apologize. If no, no, you don't I have to apologize. About everybody. Um, I, I should be a little bit more careful in how I talk about that because. No, no, it's okay. You know, Variation um, presents very differently, across, you know, across different people with that variation. So, yeah, yeah. No, that's all right. You you don't have to apologise because um, I didn't take it like that. It's just that all the data I've read. Yeah, I think it's very incorrect, and I think someone needs to do uh, a lot of new research on it. Yeah, yeah. But um, as far as um, high androgen levels and and that type of thing, yeah, I totally agree that um, the hormones play a big part in uh, the development of the brain and um, how you feel um, in, in that regard. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel, I, I do identify as a female, but a, a lot of what I do is probably not so much um, female. Mm -hmm. So I do feel very much sort of in between somewhere so um yeah I, i'm a big believer okay that the brain does play a big part with uh, the hormones um yeah because i i was born with uh, a fair bit of virilization so yeah so a lot of androgen so yeah so that bit's interesting but if you're interested in talking about it later we can oh, that would be lovely thank you so much yeah no that's okay that yeah Thank you. <clears throat> Sounds like it's just about time for me to have a gin and tonic. Um, hi, Eileen. My name is Sandra. Um, I just wondered if you had any come across any alternative theories that could challenge this sort of biological deterministic approach that, that you're saying is been a problem? I mean, are there, are there other options out there that might be accepted by the medical profession as being legitimate alternatives to this? Yes, I mean, this theory is just one theory amongst many. So yeah. it, it's quite a predominant theory, but it's not sort of like, you know, um, it's not endorsed by everybody. So there's lots of complex research that's going on. And in fact, there's a lot of really superb research that's being conducted by people like Rebecca Jordan Young and Katrina Kirkazis um, that critiques 
um, this, uh, you know, this adherence to this strict binary theory of biology and, and, and that, um, you know, points to a lot of complicating factors. Um, so yeah, there are, there are theories, but most of them sort of recognize this, that this is an incredibly complex thing that we're talking yeah. about. Um, you know, gender identity, et cetera. Um, and, um, and unfortunately, a lot of the research sees it as a very simplistic thing that, you know, there's this clear division between men and women and, and there's these very identifiable differences. And, and, and in fact, a, a really good point was just made in the chat is that a lot of this doesn't even recognize intersectionality of things like race or mm -hmm. disability and how much impact that can have. Um, so they, there's been a lot of research done on the neural correlates of homosexuality. And in a lot of that research, there's just this assumption that, that it's really easy to know whether a person is, whether a man is a gay man or, or a straight man. And that's often presented as a, as a kind of, um, I think POC is people of color. Um, it, you know, um, and that, that, that this is just a really straightforward question um, and yet, you know, if you do any research into it, you'll see that black men often don't identify as gay because that's seen as a very white um, label. And so, you know, they talk about uh, being on the down low. I mean, I'm not going to try and pretend to understand, um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the sort of terminology of, of different um, cultures, but, you know, this idea that um, sexuality is just a simple binary is just as problematic as the idea that that sex is a, is a simple binary. Mm. That's my perspective anyway. But yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of research going on to challenge these different perspectives. So oh, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> that's interesting. What's masculine in East Asian culture can be seen as feminine in Western culture. So yeah, as I say, often this intersectionality is just completely overlooked. Um, unfortunately. I'll have a gin and tonic too. <laughs> I can. <laughs> you can shout me when you ever, if you ever get out of lockdown. I'll send you, uh, I'll, I'll send you a virtual gin and tonic. Oh, great. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit late joining the meeting, uh, joining the webinar, but uh, I'm not actually sure what's involved in the webinar, so I'm going to let you all talk and <clears throat> make fools of yourself, and then I'll jump in and, uh, and, and uh, say something. Yeah? So uh, I'll let you all talk about whatever it is you want to talk about, and then I'll, and then I'll, uh, then I'll say something. Okay. Hello, Morgan and uh, Anita, uh, Sandra. Uh, and everyone else, uh, okay, I'll, I'll leave you to it. I'll, I'll just go back into the, into the background again. Well, I don't think you're really competing um, with anybody here, Candice, so. Okay, I guess I didn't hear the start of the uh, conversation, so I actually don't know what to say. Um, so I, um, you know, if I just get a feel for the conversation a bit, and then I'll, uh, I, I might, be able to ask you something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, I think that the way in which uh, legal decisions are being made is just completely deferential to the medical approach, and and uh, you know, it doesn't even engage with any of the con contradictory evidence that's out there, and that's just incredibly disappointing. So, I think the judges on in the family court have completely um betrayed um the uh you know the jurisdiction this jurisdiction was set up to protect children from unnecessary medical interventions and yet in one of the most contested and controversial um uh, areas of medical intervention they have nothing to contribute so it's really disappointing Yeah. 
I guess they haven't really been exposed to what interstate actually is, the courts, that is, you know. I remember I, I attended something with Morgan uh, years ago um, to do with law. I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, it was some uh, barrister in Sydney uh, who represented, who represented uh, um, Noreen Maywilby. Oh, yeah. uh, who was claiming at that time that she was into sex, even though she came from a trans uh, <coughs> background. And the, the, uh, the barrister that spoke, that was representing her, uh, spoke at the uh, gathering. And his interpretation of, of, uh, of inner sex was that it was an extension of trans. Yeah? So that's what we're up against. Yeah? Well, I think that if you ad adopt brain sex theory, then you would say that a person's gender identity is located in their physical brain. And in that sense, uh, you would, I guess, see that as a kind of form of intersex, but that, of course, ignores all of the lived experiences and all the actual um, sort of issues and problems facing um, um, intersex people, which is so different from trans. I mean, Trans people seek access to medical interventions and intersex people seek protection from um, non-consensual medical interventions. I mean, of course, that's not the only difference, but it's such a significant one that I think, um, you know, I think this idea that trans is a form of intersex is really just a way of trying to transform gender identity into a biological artifact and that kind of gives it somehow more legitimacy or authenticity and um I, I find that troubling but you know i don't know um yeah no i think you're right i think that um i think that the uh half the problem is the trans community uh are not um as uh what's the word um um as welcomed i guess or as, as uh, you know that they feel as though they're ostracized from society you know because they are trans their families disown mm -hmm. them uh, you know and, uh, true. yeah oh, it's true. it is true yeah yeah and then they look at the intersex people whose <coughs> whose families support them um uh, for the most part and uh, so yeah I, I can understand that you know they're wishing to be seen as the sex but like you said it's not the same thing it's not the same experience yeah? yes um, I mean, even if even if it is a form of intersex the way that it plays out in a person's life and experiences is, is so different so talking to myself here i agree sorry no. yes. <laughs> i um uh, so, hello alien i can mm -hmm. i just say um uh, that was one of the most interesting um talks i've heard on this as a concept um many of you may or most of you don't know me my name's um anita jacobs i'm actually a general surgeon but i also have a physical intersex um yeah, variation amongst many other um amongst many other congenital anomalies but my my academic interest for want of a better description has been I've done a lot of anatomy and embryology and I would like to propose a concept um, that may help at least categorize as the wrong term but when you look at how I'm going to talk about uh, in uh, I don't want to use the word normal, and I know there's clever words for it, but I apologise. When you look at somebody who is male or female and they're physically male, they're genetically male, and they identify as male, you're talking about their genes, so what the uh, egg and sperm, so the X and Y came together at time of conception, that has, through the normal um embryogenesis so the normal formation of a of a of a person a baby that has come through normally to develop into a normal male uh, looking baby and then as they grow 
they become their brain, for want of a better description, um, recognizes that they are male as well. And my, I understand at least uh, in part the complexity of that process going from an egg and a sperm coming together with the sex chromosomes allocating you to XX or XY um, in the majority of, of the human or in fact the mammalian race um, and how that develops then into a fully formed human being. Um, and the way I can help understand the difference between where intersex uh, variations come into it and where a complex group of um, variations because some of them are chromosomal variations that come out with very with um, recognizable characteristics that are similar in people with the same chromosomal anomalies then there are genetic anomalies like the um, CAH and the androgen, insensit androgen in, um, insensitivity syndromes where we know where the genes are that work, that cause those outcomes. And then there are people where the instructions to form their, their normal gen the genitalia as we would describe as male or female go wrong. And so you get those physical anomalies that affect formation of their sex organs. Can I just so say, that, interrupt briefly, just to say, I prefer to use the word words like typical because they don't have that kind of normative. Yes, and I think it's, up. thank you. I don't have the right words, but that's, I would absolutely agree with you because I, I have, a, you know, a, a, a gynecological variation that makes it all very confusing. Um, and, Intersex works often at that gene and that genetic and that physical development level. And what you have helped me begin to understand is that there's a lot more about brain sex, that is, is how we view ourselves, how an individual views themselves on that spectrum between male and female. And I think it is a continuous spectrum. It's not just one or the other. And that's a far more complex thing of probably some nature, probably some nurture, um, and they all intersect, they all interact together. And then there's also cultural stereotypes that can certainly impact on how people again perceive themselves in that spectrum of um, from male to female and the variations in between. So I hopefully I haven't confused yeah. any everybody, which no. I possibly have, but it's actually helped really me understand and um, a lot better. Okay, that's great. I'm sorry, didn't mean to talk over you there. No. Um, some researchers like Daphne Joel talk about not a spectrum, but rather that the brain is a mosaic. Oh. Uh, and so that there there may be characteristics of the brain that are more typically female or more typically male. Um, but it's not appropriate to think of it as the male brain or female brain because there's just so much variation Absolutely. Um, in every brain. And, and so she talks about the brain mosaic and she's mm -hmm. starting to have a more of an impact on some of the researchers who are looking at, uh, who are positing this brain sex binary theory and, and sort of starting to acknowledge that the picture is a lot more complex and that um, there's just such a swirl of variables and and even when we look at how um, how the brain works, we you know there's this radical plasticity. The brain doesn't isn't this kind of hardwired um, object. It's actually a, an interactive, plastic, changeable um, uh, part of the body. And and so brain plasticity um, means that the brain changes according to experience. Absolutely. And, and so that has to be factored in as well. Mm. I, 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 I certainly agree with you on that. I think the, con the, the construct of your sexual identity, not even, and that's separate again to your sexuality, who you're sexually attracted mm. to, um, is, yeah, not as, I, I, well, personally, I think it's far more complex and far more nuanced than, 
what are what are your genes and what are the hormones you've been exposed to and can you can you physically change yourself and then rewire your brain i think it's far more complex than that agreed and and as max has commented in in the chat that this pathologizing uh trans identity and and intersex variations really shifts the attention away from all the kind of social um, manipulation that that they're doing um, in mm. shoring up this rigid binary between male and female. Mm. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of trans people who don't endorse this rigid binary. You know, there's this great, much greater emphasis on fluidity. But, of course, that doesn't appear in the family court cases. So, um, you know, I've been... In, and yeah, cultures as well. So mm. you know, um, we're looking at an increasing appreciation, I think, um, culturally and socially and politically, uh, a greater appreciation of you know diversity and fluidity and and fluctuation in terms of gender and gender identity. Hopefully, hopefully, yes. And and long may it continue because I think that is going to actually help us as well so I'm a researcher and also advocates to better understand um, how some of how all these things interact because they must all interact rather than uh, situations where you know even 20 or 30 years ago in this country and I can't comment about other countries where people wanted to quote unquote normalize the all these anomalies where I think we're beginning to change or I hope society and I think to some degree medicine although I think it has a long way to go is realizing it's not about normalizing anymore it's working through what with intersex at least working through the spectrum of how, what they're presented with uh, what these individuals are born with and working through those issues to help, ideally it should be to help that individual realize themselves in an adult, in a child and then ultimately an adult form to be able to live, to be able to live function and, and work and, and respect themselves without the stigma attached. And you mentioned things like shame um, and those negative connotations, the negative issues often related to intersex with the constant looking at genitals and and all those questions about genitals and identity and all those sort of things the shame and the stigma attached to the medicalization of that is quite profound absolutely i think there were some really interesting kind of um questions here as well i mean uh, i i'm morgan i'm the executive director of era and and uh, thank you so much for, for running the presentation, Aileen. I'm sorry I had to disappear into a separate meeting uh, and I, leave you. I certainly did a, a really shitty job at first, but um, oh. I think we still did that in the end. Thank you. Uh, yeah, look, I think, that, I think that Anita and Max have both raised some really important questions. Um, and and it, it seems to me, as a researcher, um, that, that often when a population is pathologized a lot of the questions that, that that are asked in medical settings that are about etiologies uh, and trying to um, essentially you know eliminate such traits um, and it's only really when we begin to um, consider that there is a socio-cultural context to the stigmatization of particular characteristics that, that the discussion can move on to more useful, well, in my view, useful issues, such as, you know, how can we tackle the stigma? How can we tackle the discrimination? How can we support people to flourish? How can we let people um, live their best lives? And how can, how can um, society make space for the, the, um, the diversity, um, uh, of, of different kinds of bodies and characteristics and ways of being. Um, so, so I think um, I, I think there is an interesting. Um, I think the way that plays out in terms of medical research is is also fascinating. Then that the, 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 the pathologization focuses on etiologies and elimination, 
um, and, and really focusing on helping people flourish can actually help us address different kinds of clinical and legal issues. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, one of the concerns I have about the brain sex binary thesis is that in searching for the kind of biological correlates of um, atypical uh, gender behavior and identity and, and sexuality is that biology always opens itself up to um, you know curative therapy and so if they do ever identify or feel that they've identified the neural origins of say homosexuality and uh, you know I, I doubt that that's going to happen because there's been a hell of a lot of research on it over many decades but if they ever did um, you know, I think what we've got to be really concerned about is that they're going to be looking for a cure and, and a way to fix um, atypical um, uh, gender identity, atypical sexuality, and so on. So, you know, looking for a biological origin of um, atypical behavior is often seen as providing a really meaningful um, uh, justification. And, <clears throat> you know, for, for example, for homosexuality, you know, it's a way, this born, I'm born this way is a way of addressing the kind of right wing nut job idea that you should engage in <clears throat> preventative therapy. And <coughs> sorry, I've got something in my throat, but um, um, that, so it's seen as a way of protecting us against kind of therapies. <coughs> but in fact, it, it also opens up that potential for therapy. And that's really dangerous, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you're right. Even if we do know the ideology, it doesn't solve the social issues and stigma. <coughs> so we need to engage more with the lived experiences of people, I think. I think to some degree un in intersex, knowing the etiology can help, may or may not help um, uh, explain and understand. And there are people with intersex, intersex anomalies that do need medical support sure. in the appropriate setting. But you're absolutely right. It shouldn't be coerced, enforced, and certainly shouldn't be done without consent, which is all sadly <clears throat> very, it, it comes out of that historical medical paradigm where the doctor was always right. It was a very paternalistic attitude mm -hmm. and certainly within the concept of children with physical intersex anomalies, the, the concept of we've got to try and fix this and make it right ideally early so that the child wouldn't be, it could be again, quote unquote, normalized. Um, I don't know how pervasive that is still within the pediatric population because uh, I don't practice in pediatrics um, anymore, mm -hmm. but, um, Yes, having that lived experience become more, well, <clears throat> I am hoping as we all be able to be able to express our lived experience and to, you know, tell people that, that we are very much very good, we are very much physical human beings within the concepts, within the constructs that we were all born within. And we actually can lead very active lives without as much intervention as what's traditionally been. Some of it may be important and beneficial, but others of it are definitely not. And certainly not without the child being very active in that, that process or the child or adolescent, because it's not always just in childhood, but the child, um, an adolescent and young adult can, can and should be front and center of any medical intervention mm -hmm. that may or may, may, may or may not be required. And it shouldn't, the child shouldn't be a secondary factor in that. Absolutely. And I mean, moving away from an individualized perspective, because, you know, 
that tends to always be the focus of discussion about intersex people to emphasize the sort of case by case process but moving away from that to a broader thing I mean there should also be um, less of a concern about um, making sure that every child uh, looks and conforms to some, some sort of orthodoxy um, of, 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 you know, what human bodies look like. Um, of course, I'm not saying that intersex people shouldn't be free to uh, shape their own bodies as they want to um, surgically, but that should always be done with consent. I absolutely agree on that. That that um, that that should be done with the the individual making uh, expressing those wishes and working through those issues, and that should be led by them and not by um, others else. You know, not by others around them trying to to guide or determine or predetermine that in any unusual way. Um, and I certainly have a very lived experience of that, and it was actually very positive rather than very negative. Okay. Again, I, I, I suppose that in giving a talk like this, I do purport to be speaking, you know, about whole populations and, and overgeneralizing, but that certainly wasn't what I intend to do. Um, in the same way that the research on neurology of, of sex and gender is quite diverse. Um, and, you know, this brain sex binary is not hegemony, but, but rather, you know, a dominant theory. Um, I didn't mean to sort of suggest that all intersex people have the same sorts of experiences. No, I think we've had very different experiences depending on what we've got and how we've, how we've entered the medical system and at what age we entered the medical system, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite a, an individual and complex journey. It is. Mm. Uh, yeah, I agree, Morgan. I think we should wrap up if that's okay with everyone. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate that. And hey, I'm already. See you, Candice. Lovely to see you. You're gone already. <laughs> yeah, I'm gone already. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Aileen. It, it's been great to uh, listen to the presentation uh, and it'll be made available on the ERA website afterwards for people to to listen and consider the same issues. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure and I always love to hear the sound of my own voice and talk about my own research so it's been good fun as well. So thank you all for listening. I was just getting warmed up then. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, if that's, if that means goodbye. Goodbye. Well, sorry. Okay. Uh, enjoy that very much, even though I was short lived. Uh, goodbye. Bye, Candice. Yeah. <clears throat> bye bye. Okay. Good night, everyone. See you soon.